And there we go. Yeah, somebody even thinks like that would be horrible. Oof, the horror. You're walking down the street and you can't balance an equation. So if you were, you know, tired at the end of last lecture, let's um let's see if we can balance this guy. Let's try it again. Um, let's give it the old try here. You know what? Let's try something different. Let's try a different um, let me think of a different formula here. What if you had C3H8 plus O2 gives you CO2 plus water? What did I tell you um, uh, last lecture? I, I told you that every time you want to balance these, you always want to save the oxygen for last because that's kind of like your, your cheater card, right? You can always balance and you can put any number in front of oxygen to balance the equation. So let me show you how fast you would do this. I would start with carbon. All right, start with carbon. There's three carbons over here, and there's only one carbon in CO2, so you need to have at least a three here. Over here in our molecule C3H8, that's actually propane that's found in a barbecue tank or in a tank underneath the barbecue propane. You have eight hydrogens. In water, there's only two hydrogens, so what times two gives you eight? What times two gives you eight? And the answer is... Hey, sir. Yeah. Um, is that a typo, or did it change from eight to C3, CA to C3. I'm doing something different now. So I said we're going to forget about this because we did it last class and we're doing this problem right now. Okay, there's a different problem. All right, so we're balancing this combustion reaction. So again, we have three carbons, so we need to have a three here in front of our CO2. We have eight hydrogen, so we need to have a four here, right? Because four times two gives us eight. Now, we can tally up all the oxygens on this side. We have three times two, so that means we have six oxygens here, and we have four times one, so we have four oxygens here. That gives us a total of 10 oxygens, okay, in our products, our carbon dioxide and water. And so what times two gives me 10? And the answer is five, and there you have it. So that is how you would balance any combustion reaction, any one at all. You would always use, the, always use that same procedure, and remember, Last class, we did this one as a group, okay? So that's just some more practice in balancing combustion reactions. And it says here, visualizing the combustion reaction. And again, this is the one that we balanced at the very end of our lecture on Friday. We said um, two moles of octane will react with 25 moles of O2 oxygen to give us 16 moles of carbon dioxide and 18 moles of water. Look, the law of conservation of mass is alive and well because if you were to calculate, or sorry, if you were to add up all of the all of the red spheres here, right? Maybe I should use a different color, right? One, two, three, four, right? You'd end up with 50 of those, okay? 25 times two, right? And if you added up all the red spheres on this side, you'd end up with 50. So whatever number of any colored sphere we have over here, we should end up with the same number in our product. And that is a proof that this is a balanced equation and it obeys the law of conservation of mass. Let's take a look at a problem here. So let me just see, find the problem. While I'm looking for it, you guys can take a peek at it. Give me two shakes of the lamb still, there we go. The following molecular scene, so we just have one scene here, but depicts an important reaction in nitrogen chemistry. The blue spheres, so blue, Old blue here, those represent nitrogen, and the red, the red represents oxygen. Okay, write a balanced equation for this reaction. Well, let's look at the molecules on the left, and you can see that in these molecules that are on the left, so if I just take a look at, you know, any one of them, you can see that there's two nitrogens, and there's a total of one, two, three, four, five oxygen. So that means that we have N2, oops, we have N2O5, so dinitrogen pentoxide. How many of them do we have? We have one, two, three, four. So we have four dinitrogen pentoxides. And over here, oh, look, look, we have two different types of molecules. We have, we have one of these. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of these. So we have eight of these, which consist of one nitrogen and two oxygen, so that's eight NO2. And the rest of them, I'll circle them in green, we have two O2s, right? Because what I have circled in green, it's two red spheres, and the red, son of a gun. Ah, 
and all that is gone. But anyhow, what I had written was that we had um, five into, sorry, four, four into oh five, and then we ended up with four. Well, how many was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight? So we have eight and oh two plus we have two oh two, so two. O2. So there we go. There's our balanced, you know, equation for this specific reaction. Because I'm sure there's somebody out there that's saying, well, come on, Mr. Dion, couldn't you take this whole thing and divide it by two, right? So that you'd have two N2O5 gives you eight or sorry, four N2O plus oxygen. Yeah, you could totally do that. Okay. So we've gone ahead and we've written a, a balanced equation that represents this reaction based off of this little molecular scene that's been provided for us here, okay? So it says here, the reaction that we see in that scene, the reaction that's depicted in the scene is this reaction right here, but it says, writing the equation with the smallest whole number coefficients and states of matter included is right here, okay? All right, well, let's move on from there and take a look at something else. So stoichiometric calculations, that's largely gonna be the focus of today's lecture almost exclusively it will be stoichiometry it says here that if you're wondering what stoichiometry is right and you, we've been doing stoichiometry already it says in a balanced equation the amounts or moles of a substance of substances are stoichiometrically equivalent to each other which means that a specific amount of one substance is formed from um, produces or reacts with a specific amount of another the quantitative relationships are expressed stoichio as stoichiometrically equivalent molar ratios that we use as conversion factors to calculate the amount. Is it just me or is that a lot of text? That's a lot of text. Let me explain what the hell it's saying in here. Pardon my language. Remember that reaction that I just showed you? If you take propane and everybody knows that atmospheric pressure, propane is a gas. If we add that to oxygen, I'll just balance it. Um, yeah, uh, gives us three carbon dioxide gas plus um, for H2O, yeah. So this is the equation that we looked at first thing today. This is the first equation we balance. It's propane plus oxygen gives us carbon dioxide and water. Anytime you burn a hydrocarbon, you're always going to end up with carbon dioxide and water. So what stoichiometry means is that what's the relationship between the number of moles of, let's say, propane, this is called propane, and you don't have to have that memorized right now, but, you know, between propane and oxygen. Well, what my balanced equation tells me is that since there's no coefficient in front of propane, that means I have one propane, right? I can either think of it, okay, I have one propane molecule or one mole of propane. Let's think about it in terms of moles, okay? Oops, let's think about things in terms of moles. So that means when I burn one mole of propane, how many moles of oxygen am I using up? Am I burning, is it a one-to-one -one ratio? No, definitely not. You can clearly see that when you burn up one mole of propane, you actually burn five moles of oxygen. Okay, well, okay, let's think about it a different way. If I burn my one mole of propane, how many moles of carbon dioxide do I make? I make three. How many moles of water do I make? I make four. How do I figure out those relationships? I have to have a, starts with B, ends with balanced equation. And the answer is a balanced equation. You cannot do stoichiometry without a balanced equation, right? Think about it a different way. I'll throw it out to you guys. Um, let me just uh, erase this here. Also, I'll, I'll make it a little more complicated. If you burned 10 moles of oxygen, let's say you're doing the combustion of propane and you burned 10 moles of oxygen, how many moles of propane would you be consuming in that reaction if you burned up 10 moles of oxygen? Yeah, Kenner says two. Exactly. Aurora says the same thing. Great. Perfect. That's awesome. So, and if you're wondering, like, how did these people figure that out? Look, I said, if you have 10 moles of oxygen, okay, um, put here, 10 moles of oxygen, you go to your balanced equation and your conversion factor is found right there. And you know that for every time you burn up five moles of oxygen, you produce one, uh, sorry, you burn up one mole of propane, C3, C3H8, like that. And so you can see that moles of oxygen cancel, and we basically end up with 10 divided by 5, which is equal to 2 
moles of C3HA. Walla walla bing bang, okay? Now, I can see that by the, you know, Blake and Alexis and Riley and Aaron and Rebecca, they answered the question really quickly, okay? So that tells me that they probably did the math in their head, right? They just said, well, you know, if it's five to one, then it would be 10 to two, okay? You know, it's uh, not that difficult. But what you're going to see is that later on, what if I told you, you know, uh, we're going to burn exactly 23.25 moles of O2. Well, then how many moles of, of propane? Not as easy, right? It's still very doable, but you can see why being able to set these kinds of things up using dimensional analysis is so handy. And that's why we're going to use dimensional analysis basically from soup to nuts today. Now, the information in that balanced equation that we're talking about here, our propane plus our oxygen gives us carbon dioxide and water. There are many ways that you can think about this. And I've already described some of these. I said, you can think about it in terms of one of molecules, one molecule of propane plus five molecules of oxygen produces three molecules of carbon dioxide, four molecules of water, that's fine. You can think about it in terms of moles, one mole of propane produces three moles of carbon dioxide, one mole of, or sorry, four moles of water, we consume five moles of oxygen. I mean, I could keep on going. You can think about it in terms of AMU, grams, total masses, right? Law of conservation of mass. If you want to just draw spheres out, you know, get grab your colored pencils and your markers and do a little art project here and just make sure that, you know, everything's balanced. That works too. Okay. But the important thing is that you understand that you cannot have these relationships here. None of these will work unless you have a balanced equation. And that's why you have to know how to balance equations in chemistry. It's so very, very important. Well, with that in mind, let's take a look at a question where we're going to apply some of what we're talking about here and get a little stoichiometry practice in here too before the um, before the exam. Uh, it says here copper is obtained from copper one sulfide by roasting it, roasted, in the presence of oxygen gas to form powdered copper one oxide and gaseous sulfur dioxide. How many moles of oxygen are required to roast 10 moles of copper one sulfide? Look, we can write out this entire equation and we can balance it based off of what we've learned thus far in this class, okay? If you've been practicing your nomenclature, you can write out the formula for copper one sulfide. Darn tootin, you can, right? Copper one sulfide. If it's copper one sulfide, that means the copper has a one charge. Sulfide always has a two minus charge. Therefore, copper one sulfide must be Cu2S. So there we go. So we're gonna start with copper one sulfide. Um, if we're roasting it, it doesn't tell us it's a solid, but I'll assume it's a solid anyhow. And it says we're roasting it in the presence of oxygen gas. What's oxygen gas? O2 gas, beautiful. Now we have our two reactants. Um, to form powdered, what's a powder? A powder is a solid, right? Solid um, or powdered copper one oxide. Copper one and oxide. Oxide is always two minus, so that means the formula of copper one oxide must be Cu2O. So we're going to end up with some copper one oxide. What else are we going to get? We're going to get some gaseous sulfur dioxide. Hey, that's a covalent compound. So sulfur dioxide, SO2. Good. Um, did I leave out my solid here? I did. There we go. And sulfur dioxide. And it tells us it's a gas. Walla walla bing bang. We've gotten that far. Okay, can we balance this bad boy? I think we can. Let's give it the old college try. Don't pay me $3.25 an hour for nothing. So we have two coppers on the left. We got two coppers on the right. Good. We got one sulfur here and we got one sulfur. Well, hey, everything's coming up Dion. Um, over here, though, in the products, how many total moles of oxygen do we have in the products? Who can tell me total mole? Yeah, Riley's exactly right. We have a total of three, right? Now, Riley... If I take, you know, over here, I have two moles of oxygen. What times two gives me three? What times two gives me three? Something times two equals three. 1.5, exactly. So, I mean, you can do this however the heck you want. Let me move my plus sign over here a little bit. Okay. You can put 1.5 in front of there if you want. I choose to put three over two like that. Okay. So now my equation is perfectly balanced. Now, remember... Here in America, we don't like to leave fractions in our balanced uh, equations. And so 
we'll multiply the entire thing by two. And when you do that, you end up with this, um, with this equation right here. So you get two copper one sulfide plus three oxygens gives you two copper one oxide plus two um, moles of sulfur dioxide. So what the question asks us is when we burn up 10 moles of copper one sulfide, how many moles of oxygen do we get? And this should be O2 with the subscript. But anyhow, where do we get this conversion factor from? We get it from our balanced equation. And so you've got to have a balanced equation. Let me do you one more. From now on, for the rest of this class and for the rest of your life, if I see you on the street in, uh, I don't know, 20 years, okay? If I show you a reaction from now on, you always have to check to make sure it's balanced, okay? I'm not always going to provide balanced equations every time. A lot of the times I will, but not always, okay? So from now on, you always got to scope out the react, scope out the um, equation situation, right? Okay, well, let's take a look at this problem here. And this is really going to give us some good practice in stoichiometry. Um, calculating quantities of reactants and products. Okay. During the process of roasting that good old copper one sulfide, how many grams of sulfur dioxide form when we react 10.0 moles of copper one sulfide? Let me show you how to do this. Okay. Um, we're going to start with a balanced equation. Okay. So this is something that we already did. Okay, good. We're saying we're starting out with 10.0 moles of copper one sulfide. And what it's asking us is how many grams of SO2 are we making? Ay, 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 how the heck would we do this? Well, let me show you, okay? In order to determine the number of grams of sulfur dioxide, we're gonna need to figure out the number of moles of sulfur dioxide first. How are we gonna get that? Well, look, we know the ratio. We know that for every two moles of copper, one sulfide, we make two moles of sulfur dioxide. So we can use that conversion factor. So we'll start out with 10.0 moles of copper, one sulfide. We're going to use this conversion factor again that I've taken right from the balanced equation. For every two moles of copper, one sulfide consumed, I produce two moles of sulfur dioxide, and I'm sure there's somebody out there going like, well, come on, Mr. Dion, the ratio is two to two or one to one. Don't even put that in there. Hey, I'm the teacher. I'm going to put it in there, okay? I don't want to confuse anybody, so I like to put every dirty detail in there when I can. Um, and now, if we were to stop right now, we'd have the moles of sulfur dioxide. That's not what we're, we're being asked for. We're being asked for the number of grams of sulfur dioxide. I've already gone ahead and calculated the molar mass of SO2 from the periodic table, 64.07 grams uh, per mole. So I've gone ahead and done that already, and we can use that here. So we know that in one mole of SO2, we have 64.07 grams of SO2. Look at that. Is this beautiful or what? Moles of sulfur dioxide cancel out. We punch all that spinach into our calculator. Hey, I'll just throw this out there to the to the gallery. Does anybody, can anybody tell me how many sig figs there should be in the final answer here? Some people are saying four. I want to say three. Yeah, I'll say three as well. Yeah, because if you go back to the question, right, we're given 10 moles, which has three sig figs, right? Even though I reported the molar mass to four sig figs, which is kind of a general rule in Silverberg's book. She always reports all molar masses to four sig figs or something like that. Anyhow, so we should have three sig figs. I punch that in and I get 600 and what did I get? 641 grams of SO2. Give me a thumbs up if you think you could do that if you had a balanced equation, a nice, tasty, delicious balanced equation. Great. Thanks, Blake. Is that a Hulk Hogan? It looks like Hulk Hogan in there. Anyhow, um, all right, perfect. All right, Dayona, or Dayona, Dayona, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correct, um, gives two thumbs up. All right, I'll take it. Somebody else says C. All right, I gotta stop reading these things, okay? Uh, let's get back to the task at hand. Let's see. You guys wanna try another problem that involves stoichiometry? I don't care, I do. Let's do it. 
This one here says, yeah, absolutely. We're going to look at a few, uh, Joy. We're going to look at a few. Um, let's see here. Hey, we can't get off that roasting reaction. So if your mic's on, if you could mute it, that'd be great. Uh, this question says, during the roasting of that copper one sulfide, how many kilograms of oxygen are required to form uh, 2.86 kilograms of copper one oxide? Look, the whole roadmap is out here. And if you're ever wondering like, hey, Mr. Dion, how come we don't spend a lot of time talking about this? It's on your slide. Look, that's one way of approaching the problem, okay? This is Dr. Silverberg's way of doing it. She is the author of the book. If you like the way she does it, great. Okay, great, that's no problem. But I have, you know, what I think is another way where it's basically doing the same thing. Oh, dang, is the solution out here. I hate that. Um, anyhow, I'll, I'll walk through the solution with you, okay? so. We start with our balanced equation, okay? That's where we're always starting. And here's our balanced equation right here. Now, we have 2.86 grams of copper one oxide. The first thing we need to do is to convert that into grams. Well, you should know that in one kilogram, you have 1,000 or 10 to the three grams. So we use that conversion factor. That just gives us the number of grams of copper one oxide. Then we need to figure out the number of moles of copper one oxide. So we use the formula mass of copper one oxide. That gives us the number of moles of copper one oxide. Now, how am I going to figure out the number of moles of oxygen that's consumed? I'm going to use my balanced equation. I know the ratio is three to two, right? So I can use this conversion factor right here, which came directly from my balanced equation. And then I can multiply that by the molar mass of oxygen and then I convert that into kilograms. There you go. So that's how we would do a problem like that. Um, let's try one. Uh, let's keep moving. All right. Uh, let's see here. Reactions in sequence. So I am not going to ask you to um, add reactions together or to calculate a, a theoretical, sorry, a, um, a limiting reactant on the, the exam. But it's still very important. Um, there was something else I wanted to see. What is it? Um, oh, I know what it is. If you go in my YouTube channel under the Chemistry 1401 playlist, I have published um, or posted two videos that cover the solutions for, or mo most of the solutions for the practice exam. Okay, almost all of them. The last video where I solved the last couple problems, I'm going to edit that right as soon as this class ends, and then I'll post it immediately. OK, so what time does class end? Um, one, one, 1 p.m., right? Kidding, kidding. I know it's 1040. So as soon as class is over, probably 10, 20 minutes after that, I will have that last video published. So literally all the solutions are up there with my guided, you know, me yammering through the whole thing. OK, all right. 1040 p.m. <laughs> OK, all right. Well, let's get into this one. Reactions in sequence and the whole um, idea of doing reaction tables. This is something that some students find helpful. There's other ways of approaching it. And I'm going to try to show you both ways. So let's talk about reactions in sequence. It says for stoichiometric purposes, when the same substance forms in one reaction and reacts in the next. So that means it's common in both reactions. So basically the product of one reaction of your first reaction becomes a reactant in the next uh, reaction. It says we can eliminate that substance overall in what we call a net equation. So what we do in order to write out reactions in sequence, first we write out all of the balanced equations, then we adjust them arithmetically, <laughs> arithmetically in order to cancel the common substances. I'll show you how to do that. And then you add them all over together and you get the overall, or sometimes we call this the net balanced equation. I'll probably use both. And if you're wondering, well, let's, uh, how do we do that? Oh, let's give it a try here. Man, we can't get it away from roasting today. Anywho, let me just look at my notes here to make sure. Okay, so I'm going to write the reactions on this page. So it says here, roasting is the first step in extracting copper from calcite, the ore used in the previous problem. Okay, now you remember the roasting process. Now this is what we did on, I think, the you know one of the first slides this morning was this. I'm going to write it out here. So this is a reaction we've already looked at. The first step was when we had our two moles of copper one oxide, okay, plus 
three moles of oxygen. Again, this is something we already did a few minutes ago. Produces two moles of copper one oxide, the powder, plus um, plus um, two moles of sulfur dioxide, like that. Okay, so now we're talking about, I'm going to change to the blue pen, and we're going to talk about the second step. It says here, in the next step, okay? So second step, what do we do? We're going to take copper one oxide, so Cu2O, which we knew was a powder. It reacts with powdered carbon. So powdered carbon, I mean, that's just going to be carbon, and it's a powder, so it's a solid. Good enough. Um, powdered carbon to yield copper metal. What's copper metal? If you've ever seen a copper roof before, it's just plain old copper, solid copper. If you've ever messed around with wet a copper pipe in your house, maybe, probably not. I asked this to the students. Does anybody here ever sweat a joint, you know? And they're like, what are you talking about? Is that drugs, Mr. Dion? No, that's plumbing. Anyhow, uh, what else? Um, what else? We get carbon monoxide gas. So again, little, little nomenclature there for you. So here's the second step, okay? Is this equation balanced? I would say no, it is not balanced, okay? We have two coppers over here, and we only have um, one copper over here, so we're going to have to put a two in front of there. We have one oxygen, one oxygen, one carbon, one carbon. So that looks pretty good now. But could we add these two reactions together the way that they're written? Okay, because you can see that we have two things that are common, right? Copper one oxide and copper one oxide. And it said, okay, it said on the previous slide, okay, that we have to adjust them arithmetically, okay, to cancel the common substances. And so what we're going to have to do then is we're going to have to multiply this whole second step. We're going to take the whole kit and caboodle and we're going to multiply it by two. Why would we do that? Because then we'll have two, two, right? Four and two, okay? Four and two. I'm kind of scribbling here. But that's going to enable us to cancel out the copper one oxide and we'll get our net equation. I'm going to erase all this green stuff except for the multiply by two because I have that shown, I believe, on the next slide right here, okay? So here is first step. This is what I just wrote down. This is second step, okay? Then we take that whole kit and caboodle and we multiply it by two. When we multiply it by two, we get this equation shown right here. And then you can see, like I just showed you, that we can cancel the two copper one oxides. When you tally all that up, you end up with, this reaction. I want to make sure I don't miss anything here. Get out the blue pen. We get two copper, two, sorry, two copper, one sulfide. So I got rid of that plus three oxygens. The only reason I'm crossing these off is so I don't make a mistake in front of my students. Okay. It's got nothing to do with eliminating anything. Plus two carbon solid, right? So those are the three reactants. Okay. And what are my products? I end up with four copper. Solid plus two carbon monoxide gas plus two sulfur dioxide. Okay. Yeah, that looks good to me. Okay, so um, we're adding it all up together like that. All right, beautiful. You know, what are the things you got to have here? You got to have balanced equations. You know, how, how the heck did we even come up with these balanced equations? If you're sitting there with your mouth open, just kind of like, what? Where did we get those? We got those just by reading a problem and using a nomenclature skill. You can see why nomenclature is important. If you, if you st and if you were working on your nomenclature practice, and you're like, dang, this is hard. It's a lot of things to remember. You know, I made flashcards, polyatomic ions. Oh, I'm overwhelmed. The good news is this. If you can master nomenclature, and you've got to master it, it's going to be helpful. Today, tomorrow, I promise you, man, in December, you'll still be able to use it, okay? You take Gen Chem 2 with me in January, you're still going to be able to use it, okay? In May, at the end of Gen Chem 2, you're still going to be able to use it. You will not ever come to a point in your chemistry life where you'll be like, wow, nomenclature, boy, I wasted time on that. Never, never. It will always be useful, okay? So I'm saying that to encourage you, not to discourage you, um, to, to really... Remember that learning how to name compounds is challenging, but it's very rewarding and it can really help you out a lot. All right, I, you know, last uh, spring I taught this class in Centennial Hall. Um, a great class. I had 
you know, maybe 120 students in the class. It's a big class, but I tried to learn everybody's name. And I remember the day, I, I don't remember any lectures that I taught, you know, specifically, except for this one, because the students were laughing. I don't know, they thought it was so funny, my example of the hot dog. But anyhow, I guess you had to be there. Anyhow, let's talk about limiting reactants. So it says here, so far, we've made some really big assumptions, right? We've assumed that reactants are present in the correct amounts every stinking time. We have just the right amount of everything. But, you know, reality bites, right? In reality, one reactant may limit the amount of product that can form. The limiting reactant will be completely used up. So if you want to know what the heck is a limiting reactant, it's a reactant. Where are the reactants? Reactants are the starting materials, right? That gets completely used up. The reactant that is not limiting, we say that that reactant is in excess. Sometimes I just abbreviate it excess like that. Some of this reactant will be left over. So here's an example. You want to make some hot dogs, okay? You get together with some buddies. You're like, what do we got here? We got five wieners. We got uh, four buns, okay? How many hot dogs can we make if each hot dog has to have one bun and uh, one wiener? And the answer is you can only make four because you're limited by the amount of buns. I mean, that's a pretty simple example, but your buns are limiting, right? And your wieners are in excess. So if we take a look at another example, I mean, we could do this all day, look at all kinds. This is, I believe, Silberberg's example. She chose a Sunday. Uh, Dr. Silberberg's recipe for Sundays is two scoops of ice cream, cherry, 50 mils of syrup. This just cracks me up. I mean, she's such a nerd. I shouldn't say that. Uh, but anyhow, I mean, who the heck cooks using a graduated cylinder? <laughs> I mean, seriously, she doesn't have like a measuring cup or anything. Anyway, it's kind of funny, but you get the idea, okay? So that's her recipe for a uh, for a Sunday. Um, let's see here. So uh, she says, okay, you get together with some buddies, some friends, some well-wishers. People in your residence, people you met, I don't know, at university. You get uh, eight total scoops of ice cream. You get uh, six cherries. But you've only got 200 milliliters of syrup, and you need 50 mils, right? The total cherries, I mean, you could make six if you had enough materials, right? And with your ice cream, you could make a total of four sundaes if you had everything else unlimited. But you're limited by the amount of uh, chocolate syrup, okay? People are real chocolate fiends, okay? I can't have a Sunday without syrup. Okay, anyhow. Uh, so let's see here. Uh, so we end up with two Sundays. So that's my limiting reactant is my syrup. So we call this the limiting reactant. I'll just abbreviate it LR like that. And um, then in excess, we have the cherries and the ice cream scoops. Who Give, give me a thumbs up if you follow me on th these two examples, your wieners, your buns, your scoops. All right, one person, great, I'll take it. That's good enough for me. Okay, I got a couple of people. Good, because now we're gonna move on to something not nearly as tasty, and it's gonna be chlorine trifluoride. It says here, chlorine trifluoride, could you draw, could you write out the formula for chlorine trifluoride? CLF3. Um, hold on. I'm gonna give you a second to read this problem. I'm just gonna, All right, uh, let's see here. Chlorine trifluoride, an extremely reactive substance, is formed as a gas, so it tells us it's a gas, by the reaction of elemental chlorine and fluorine. Right? Chlorine is Cl2 gas, fluorine is F2 gas. The molecular seam, so shown right here, shows a representative portion of the reaction mixture before the reaction starts, Chlorine is green, fluorine is yellow. So what do we have? We have a total of three Cl2s plus one, two, three, six F2s, okay? I'm kind of scribbling down here at the bottom and we end up with ClF3 as our product, okay? 
ClF3. Now, I realize that this equation is not balanced, okay? Um, and we're not dealing with a balanced equation yet, okay? I just want to get the idea across to you. So it says find the limiting reactant and write a reaction table for the for the process. Draw a representative portion of the mixture after the reaction is complete. Oh, good, Greg, you have nothing. Well, let's do the first two parts, okay? Mr. Dion is not much of an artiste, okay? So let's do the first two parts. Oops. So let's see here. So the first thing that we have to do is write a balanced equation. And I'm just going to do it up here, okay? So I'm going to eliminate all of this right now. And we have chlorine gas plus fluorine gas gives us chlorine trifluoride gas. Now let's balance this. Okay, I have two chlorines on the left and only one chlorine on the right, so I have to put a two here. Now I have a total of two times three fluorine, so that's six. So if I put a three in front of there, I will have balanced my equation, okay? So that's an equation that I expect you be able to do balance. But remember, over here, it's saying that we have a representative, you know, portion of the mixture. And again, we said that we had three molecules, three molecules of Cl2, and we had a total of six molecules of F2. And so what we're going to do is we're going to set this up. We're going to do two sets of math, okay? And if you're unsure of what a limiting reactant is, okay, take a deep breath, and I'm going to explain it to you right now, okay? <sighs> okay, what you're going to do is two sets of equations. First, you're going to say, okay, if I had three molecules or three moles or whatever, three molecules of chlorine, Cl2, and all of the fluorine in the universe, I'm not limited by the amount of fluorine, how many moles of ClF3 would I make? Well, you can see the ratio is one to two. So if I start with three, I'm going to end up with six moles of that, right? ClF3. If I have six moles of F2, here's my second or six molecules of F2. If I have six molecules of F2 and all of the chlorine available in the universe, how much ClF3 could I, could I produce? Can anybody do that in their head? Not as simple. The ratio is three to two, okay? So if it's six, it's gonna be six to four. I'm gonna end up with four moles of ClF3. Okay, here's, thank you, perfect. Here's where it gets interesting, okay? We have two possibilities. We can either end up with six moles of Cl. Oops, did I miss a letter there? Six moles of ClF3 or four moles of ClF3. What was the whole point of this? Was that we're limited by whichever one is gonna end up making us the least amount of product, okay? And so our limiting reactant here is what? Our limiting reactant is, no, Mr. Dion's losing it. Our limiting reactant is the fluorine because we end up with less chlorine trifluoride. Now I have that dimensional analysis worked out over here. From the balanced equation, okay, shown right here, the same old equation we balanced, here's the math. You set it up, again, and I'm repeating myself like an old man, okay? First, you say, I have three molecules of chlorine. I use this conversion factor, it comes from my balanced equation, and I determine, okay, if I had three molecules of chlorine, all the fluorine in the universe, I could make a maximum of six molecules of ClF3. Okay, what if we tried the same thing with fluorine? If I had six molecules of fluorine, all the chlorine in the universe, what's the maximum amount of fluorine trifluoride I could make? And the answer is four molecules. So since the given amount of fluorine can form less product, it is limiting. It is the limiting reactor. That means, again, and I'm repeating myself for the third time, the maximum amount of ClF3 that you could make would be four molecules. Now, this whole reaction table thing, that works for some students. Some students seem to really like the reaction table. Okay, and so we've already determined that fluorine is the limiting reactant. That means just like the chocolate syrup, the chocolate syrup was the limiting reactant in making our sundae, so all the chocolate syrup got eaten up, right? It all got consumed. Since fluorine is the limiting reactant, and we said in that depiction, which is shown down here, right? Or no, that's not it. Where was it? 
And yeah, I just wanted, and I'm sure you all follow me, but I'm talking about this depiction here. We started with three molecules of chlorine, six molecules of fluorine. Okay, so that's what they're using here in this table. Okay, that's where this three and this six comes from. It comes from the picture. Okay, if fluorine is limiting, it's going to all get consumed. And that's why the initial amount of fluorine is six molecules. The initial amount of fluorine is three molecules, but you're losing all of the fluorine, right? It's You're going to end up with zero because it's limiting, just like the chocolate syrup or just like the, the buds, right? You ended up with nothing in the end, nothing left over. You end up with wieners and cherries and ice cream scoops. But anyhow, if I consume six molecules, all six molecules of my fluorine, how many molecules of chlorine am I going to consume? Well, the ratio is three to two. Oh, sorry, three to one. So it's going to be six to what? Six to two. Now I do my math for my chlorine, right? And I find out the three minus two, I'm left over with one molecule of Cl2. And that's what's shown right here is that one molecule of Cl2. Now, what about the product, the chlorine trifluoride? Same thing. We started with nothing, okay? We're going to make some. How much? Well, if I consume six molecules of F2, what's the ratio? Three to two. So it's going to be six to four, all right? And I end up with a total of four molecules of my chlorine trifluoride. Here they are, one, two, three, four. All right. So that's the scene that's left over. Give me a thumbs up if that helps clear up what a reaction table is, what's shown here. Remember, with the reaction table, you've got to figure out the limiting reactant ahead of time. Okay, great. Good. Great. All right, perfect. And the thing is, is these, these reaction tables, um, the reason they're so great, um, and I'm not that, I'm not a mega fan of them. I find it easier to just subtract, you know, and I'll show, and if you're like, what do you mean? I'll show you how to do that later on in the class. But the reason that they're so important is sometimes it's important to know what you have in excess because that can be used in another reaction. Another thing about this, uh, the whole limiting reactant thing is, um, if you're running a reaction on a large scale, like on an industrial scale, you have to be able to save money, you know, to work effectively and save money. And so, um, yeah, if you want to limit the amount of, you know, materials that are left over, well, let's move on and try even more practice, okay? We can't get away from that same problem that says here, in another preparation of chlorine trifluoride, 0 0.75 moles of chlorine reacts with, um, three moles of fluorine, find a limiting reactant, and write a reaction table. Let's do it. Let's do the whole thing here. Find a limiting reactant, write a reaction table. So let's start with finding the limiting reactant. So the first thing we need is our balanced equation. We already did that, so I'm going to write it out. We have chlorine gas um, plus three moles. So one mole of chlorine gas plus three moles of fluorine gas produces two moles of chlorine trifluoride gas. There we go. That's our balanced equation. Now we're going to find the limiting reactant. Okay, take a deep breath. If you don't follow me, if you do follow me, pay attention anyway. Well, let's do it. So first we're going to start with the chlorine. Okay, first we'll start with Cl2. We have 0 0.750 moles of Cl2. Okay, well, how many moles of C ClF3, how many moles of chlorine trifluoride could we make? I'm going to go to my balanced equation. I see the ratio is one to two. So for every one mole of Cl2 that gets consumed, I produce two moles of ClF3. Looky, looky. Units cancel out beautifully, and I end up with 1.50 moles of ClF3. Okay, that's scenario one. Let's try the other scenario. What if we had three moles of fluorine and all the chlorine in the universe. Well, let's write it out. We'd start with 3.00 moles of F2. Seems like a lot. We're going to use our conversion factor. For every three moles of fluorine, we produce two moles of uh, chlorine trifluoride. Now, I know you're probably thinking, okay, Mr. Dion, I, you don't have to do this one for me. I can see that it gives you two moles. But anyhow, I'm the teacher, so I'll set it up in dimensional analysis here. For every three moles of uh, fluorine you consume, you produce two moles of chlorine trifluoride, like that, moles cancel out, and we end up with our final answer, which is two moles of Cl, I should use the correct number of sig figs, shouldn't I? 
2.00 moles of ClF3. Which one is a lower number, 1.50 or 2? Answer is 1.50. And so that is the maximum amount of product that we could make. So who could tell me which one of these is the limiting reactant? Is it chlorine or fluorine? Not a trick question. Yeah, exactly. It's chlorine. Yeah, perfect. Perfecto. Excellent. So um, we're limited by the amount of chlorine. So we'll write down here Cl2 is limiting reactant. All right. Now, the reaction table, I think I've gone ahead and probably, you know, put that all together in here in the solutions. But um, we're starting out with. 0 0.750 moles of our Cl2. Maybe I'll use my highlighter. There we go. Starting it with three moles of this. We already decided that chlorine was the limiting reactant. So that means it's going to be completely consumed and we're going to be left over with no chlorine, just like the chocolate syrup, just like the buns. Okay, I'm sure you can Google it and find all kinds of other satsy examples out there. Um, so what's the ratio? If the ratio of Chlorine to fluorine is one to three, right? One, two, three. What's three times 0.75? It's going to be 2.25. So how much of the fluorine is going to be consumed? Only this much. And we're going to be left over with a little bit. Um, what's the ratio of chlorine? Oops, I meant to erase that. What's the ratio of chlorine to chlorine trifluoride? It's one to two, right? One, two, two. So if I use up one of these, I'm going to produce two. Two times 0.75 is 1.5, and I end up with a total of 1.50. And you're like, didn't we just figure that out? Yes, we absolutely did. It was right here. Okay. The reaction table is just another way of approaching, of approaching or representing in a limiting, a limiting reactant problem. All right, who's feeling more confident about uh, limiting reactants? Cha? No, there are no reaction tables that you have to fill in on the exam. All right, Kenner says me. Um, let me see here. I'm trying to find one I don't have the answer to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't like it when I put the solutions in right away. Um, maybe I could do something different here. Just give me a second. Da, 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 da. Okay, let's take a look at this problem here. It says here, a fuel mixture used in the early days of rocketry consisted of two liquids, hydrazine. You're like, that's not, is that what it's called? Yeah, it's a common name, hydrazine and dinitrogen tetroxide. That's obviously a name that you would be able to come up with, which ignite on contact form of nitrogen gas and water vapor. How many grams of nitrogen gas Form when one, so 100 grams of hydrazine and 200 grams of dinitrogen tetroxide are mixed together. Well, the first thing we should do is um, write out a balanced equation. Okay, that's the first thing we need to do. And you're like, well, how would I come up with that? Look, everything is given to you in the word problem, right? It says here you're taking hydrazine into H4, it tells you it's a liquid. Um, it tells you you're combining it with dinitrogen tetroxide, N2O4, which is also a liquid. And they ignite on contact to form nitrogen gas, so N2 gas plus water vapor. So that's H2O gas, not vapor is a gas, right? So now we need to balance this bad boy. So let's give it the old college try. We've got a total of four nitrogens in our reactants. So we're going to have to put um, four there. No. No, oh, there's an easier way to balance this. Let me just think out loud here for a second. Let's save the nitrogen for last, okay? Because it's the only thing that's by itself, we'll, so we'll leave it alone. Um, we got four hydrogens, so we're going to need a two over here. We've got um, four oxygens, so we're going to need at least a four over there, okay? So a minimum of a four. What else? How many oxygens do we have? Or sorry, how many nitrogens do we have on this side here? We have a total of four. We have two. Um, so we have two, and then we have three. Okay, is that balanced? 
think it is six, six, eight, eight, and four, and four. Okay, so now we have a balanced equation, and let's work out the rest. So since I don't have a blank page here, I'm actually going to go into a different file here, over to a different class, and pick a blank PDF, totally different subject, and I'll work the problem out here since some of my students are interested in getting more practice in limiting reactions. So let's write this down. We've got two hydrogens, two N2H4 um, liquid plus N2O4 liquid gives us two, or sorry, three nitrogens gas plus four water vapor. Okay, now let's dig into the problem here. So it told us that um, we've got uh, 1.00 times 10 to the 2 grams of this, and we have 2.00 times 10 to the 2 grams of this. And then it's asking us how many grams of nitrogen gas. So grams, how many grams of nitrogen gas are we going to make? All right, here is how you solve a limiting reactive problem. We're going to do two steps. First, we're going to take this quantity and we're going to imagine that we have all the N2O4 in the universe. So we don't have to worry about that. Let's start with that. So we've got 1.00 times 10 to the 2 grams of N2H4. Okay. Um, and we're asked for mass of nitrogen. So I'm just going to work all of that out in one fell swoop. I've already gone ahead and looked up the mass of hydrazine, the molar mass which is 32.05 grams of N2H4. Where did I get that? Starts with P, ends with periodic table. The periodic table in one mole of N2H4. Now I want to figure out the number of moles of nitrogen. If I was to stop right here, I'd have the moles of N2H4. To get the moles of nitrogen, I'm going to get a conversion factor from my balanced equation. And I know that for every two moles, two moles of N2H4 of hydrazine, I produce three moles of nitrogen. So three moles of nitrogen. Now they're asking me for the mass of nitrogen. So I'm going to go ahead and do the last step, which is in one mole of N2, we have a total of, I just want to make sure I put the, I know it's 28. Um, did I not work? 28.02. 28.02 grams of nitrogen. So when you punch all of that spinach into your calculator, good gravy, I didn't do it. Let me see here, 100 times, no, nope, 100 divided by 32.05, um, multiplied by 1.5, multiplied by 28.02. Give me, that gives me 131 grams of nitrogen. Okay, so there's that. Now we're gonna do the same exercise for um, dinitrogen tetroxide. So we're going to start with 2.00 times 10 to the 2 um, grams of N2O4. We're going to figure out the number of moles. So one mole of N2O4 weighs 92.02 grams. I got that from the periodic table. Now I need a conversion factor to convert the number of moles of N2O4 into the number of moles of nitrogen. And I get that from my Balanced equation, right? Two moles, sorry, one mole of N2O4, one mole of N2O4 gives me three moles, three moles of N2, and then I use this last conversion factor, one mole of nitrogen contains 28.02 grams of nitrogen, and I don't think I did that one either. Why did I not do that? Good gravy, man. All right, let me try here. 200. Divided by 92.02 uh, times 3 times 28.02. 182, so you get 182, 183 rounding up grams of N2. What's a smaller number, 131 or 183? Well, 131 is a smaller number, so that tells us that what? That hydrogen, N2H4, is the limiting reactant. And if you're like, Mr. Dion, that's a lot of work. Who thinks that that's a lot of work scribbling all that down? Look at all those beautiful units that I included in there. Who thinks that's a lot of work? Anybody? Okay, good. 
Uh, I mean, yeah, <laughs> a, a little bit. Well, look, you got to get over that because in chemistry, if you take general chemistry too, routinely, I say ru quite routinely, problems will take an entire page, an entire page of paper. Yeah, to solve. So, yeah, you just have to do all the math. But look, it's very repetitive. Once you understand what's going on, it's just a lot of repetition. Now, I was nervous about doing the calculation on my calculator here in my office live because my calculator is from like 1970. It doesn't have like a reverse function or anything like that. All right, well, let's um, go back to our slides. Where's my chemistry 1401 stuff? There we go. Anything we can't do in this class? Uh, what else? Reaction yields. Reaction yield. So I don't know if I told you. Um, I don't know if I told you in my introduction. I suppose I did. That I worked in industry for most of my adult life, basically from 2001 until about 2016. Um, I worked as a bench chemist in industry and, you know, reaction yields. I told my wife when I started teaching full time, I said, if I ever complain too much about being a teacher, I want you to grab me by the face, okay, and scream at me, um, low yield. Okay, all you have to do is say low yield and I'll snap out of it. I'll be like, yeah, 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 I'm happy, I'm happy. Okay, because I can't tell you how many times I did a reaction as a chemist, you know, my lab coat and glasses, and I said, okay, theoretical yield of this reaction, you know, uh, you know, my boss would say, we need two grams of this compound. Okay, I'm going to do a reaction. It's got a theoretical yield of two grams. Maybe even it's got a theoretical yield of, you know, three grams. I'm going to have more than enough, man. I'm going to have tons of product to give this guy. And then I come up, you know, the next morning. It's a Tuesday morning. It's rainy outside. And I'm like, uh, yeah, Ed, I get uh, 100 milligrams, man. I have to go back. Uh, shoot. Uh, you know? You can hear the disappointment in my voice. So, you know, theoretical yield, that would be kind of like Instagram, you know, and then actual yield. What would that be? I don't know. Uh, has anybody heard the difference between like Rinsta and Finsta? I don't know. Anyhow, so actual yield is like reality TV. Yeah, reality is just like all the dirty, you know, the horrible, everything just thrown in there. So that's what actual yield is. Real life. We'll put it there. Reality. All right. Anyhow, actual yield is the actual amount of product that you get. The actual yield is usually less. Are you kidding me? It's almost always less than the theoretical yield. I'll tell you what, if you're like usually less, could it be more? Well, theoretically, no. It cannot be. It's not theoretically. It's impossible because you can't create matter. The only time you get an actual yield that's higher than theoretical yield is when you have something that's not supposed to be in your reaction mixture. You know, you isolated some crud. You know, some junk. So you have to know this formula. It's not asked on your on this um, exam, but you've got to know moving forward how to calculate percent yields of actual over theoretical multiplied by 100 percent, and you end up with percent yield. Has anybody here ever calculated a percent yield before in another class? No. Anyway, has anybody seen the meme that's going around the internet that kind of looks like this? It's except it looks like a like uh, it's an um, exit off of the highway. You see everybody's going the main way, and then it's like, Beep! everybody's turning this direction. Okay. Well, yeah, Riley's seen it. Okay. Anyhow, so this is reality, right? You set up, you work really hard, you know, to try to get to one product. But, you know, um, the first job I ever had, I shared an office with somebody who knew, you know, more about chemistry in his little finger than I did in my whole body. And um, he had a lot more experience. And, you know, I got a re I had a reaction and it just didn't work. You know, it just didn't do what I wanted it to do. And he kind of took me by the side and, you know, spoke very nicely to me. But he said, you know, molecules are going to do what they're supposed to do. OK, like they're going to do. So, you know, if they're going to go, if they're going to go this way, there's nothing you're going to do to stop that. OK, anyhow, with that in mind, let's take a look at an example of calculating percent yield. And I think this is the last problem that I have in the entire chapter. So, yeah, let's take a look at it. Silicon carbide is made by reacting sand. So sand is silicon dioxide, SiO2, with powdered carbon at high temperature. Um, 
Carbon monoxide is also formed. What is the percent yield if 51.4 kilograms of silicon carbide is recovered from processing 100 grams of sand? First thing we need to do is write a, a balanced equation. Let's try that. You never get enough practice in writing out a balanced equation. So it says that we're starting by reacting sand, silicon dioxide. Sand is a solid, obviously, with powdered carbon. Powder is a solid. Um, and then we're going to form um, silicon carbide. So S I C. Um, silicon carbide is also a solid. It doesn't tell us that explicitly. Um, and what else do we get? We also get carbon monoxide. You should know that carbon monoxide is not a solid. It is a gas. It comes out of your car's exhaust. Anyhow, now we can balance this guy. Um, let's see here. I'll just do it quickly in the interest of time. Okay, I balanced that really quickly, but I just wanted to have a balanced equation. So here's our balanced equation. That's not balanced. I need no balanced equation. We need our three and our two. All right, so it says, what is the theoretical yield if we start out with 100.0 kilograms of silicon dioxide, but we end up producing... 51.4 grams of silicon carbide. So we end up with 51.4 kilograms of this, okay? Let's figure out what the theoretical yield of silicon carbide would be. You're like, how would you do that? Let me show you. You're gonna start with 100 kilograms of silicon dioxide. The first thing we'll do is we'll convert that into the number of grams. And we know that in one kilogram, there's a thousand grams. Okay, so we've got that done. So if we were to stop right here, we just have the grams of silicon dioxide. Okay, now we need to convert that into the number of moles. I've already gone ahead and calculated the molar mass of SiO2, and it's 60.09 grams per mole. So that means that 60.09 grams of SiO2 in one mole of SiO2. Then we're going to figure out the number of moles of silicon carbide. I know it's a one-to-one -one ratio. I know you can all calculate it in your head, but again, I'm your instructor, so I'll write it out in dirty detail here. One mole of silicon carbide. Then we need to figure out what's the mass of silicon carbide. Well, we know that in one mole of silicon carbide, we have 40.10. 40.10 grams per mole. Okay, so 40.10 grams of silicon carbide. See, all our units are canceling out, but we want the answer in kilograms. And so we'll add one more conversion factor. And in one gram, we have, sorry, how much do we have? I'm getting tired. 1,000 grams, we have one kilogram. All right, so when you punch all of that spinach, and that's a lot of spinach. Okay, into your calculator, you end up with um, kilograms, kilograms of silicon carbide, and I've done that, and it's um, 66.73 kilograms. There you go. So that's what you're supposed to obtain. That is the theoretical yield. If everything worked out perfectly well, this is what you would obtain in an ideal world. But it told you in the problem that what you actually ended up with was what? 51.4. Didn't get all the product out. Some of it went in the wrong direction. So our percent yield is going to be 51.4 kilograms divided by our theoretical yield, 66.73 kilograms. Those units cancel out. We multiply by 100%, and we end up with um, 77. Point zero percent. It's actually not that bad, okay? And um, this is the kind of thing I shouldn't be recording, but if you're ever wondering, you know, if you're wondering, well, if I was in a research group, why couldn't I just cheat and just, you know, tell everybody, oh, I got this product in a 90% yield. Nobody else is, you know, going to double check or it's a 99% yield. I wouldn't be surprised if in some high pressure research groups they do that. It wouldn't shock me at all. Anywho, there we go. So that covers all the material in chapter three. That's everything from soup to nuts. All right. Well, we've got a few minutes left. I'll open it up and.
Anybody have any questions? Percent yield is where it's at. Yeah, because this mean combustion chambers are actually not super accurate. No, I would say no. I think that combustion chambers, I've never used one in my life. I've never done any kind of elemental analysis or, you know, analysis of anything like that. That's more, that's more in the field of analytical chemistry, which I studied analytical chemistry in university. And once I was done, I, I went to the bar and took two shots. I shouldn't be recording this to try to forget it. Um, anyhow, no, I'm kidding. I don't remember it. But um, no, I would say they're pretty accurate. The accuracy would be based off of, you know, the balance that you're using to weigh the mass before and after. And also probably the um, uh, how good the adsorbent is. Um, what else? Are you going to put the laundry list of tests out sometime today? Yes, I will. Class on Monday. Are you kidding me? No, it's Labor Day. There's no class on Monday. Where, where should you go to find out if there's class or not? I'll give you a clue. Starts with S, ends with syllabus or illibus. I notice converting Hertz in the practice, could not find it. There's no conversion for Hertz. A Hertz is just a reciprocal second. Um, uh, the correct periodic table is the one that I have posted in the announcement. Um, what is the day of the test? The day, there is no day for the test. The test is open for a few days. Yeah, it's open on Monday too. Yep. The test opens today at 11 and it closes on Monday at five, I think. Yep. This is remote learning. There is no holiday, so it's open. Yeah. I gave you lots of time. Also, I also posted another announcement this morning that I extended the um, the time for the practice exam. I actually went into Canvas to see how many people uh, had submitted it. I wasn't satisfied. A lot of people hadn't submitted it or hadn't uh, tried it. So I gave you an extra day. So you have all day, I think it's today, anyhow. So you have an extra day to try that. So I would recommend giving it a try. You know, it doesn't take a long time. The exam, I give you 120 minutes. I think that's, or 80, sorry, 80 minutes. I think that's more than enough time to complete it. It's not that long in my opinion. Now I'm the teacher, so you know I probably shouldn't think that it's very long. But um yeah, I don't think it's really super long exam. Um just want to be sure we have to show you a form of identification and then show our scratch paper. Yes, you have to show your student ID. If you don't have a student um ID, you can use a driver's license or something like that. Um, how many questions are on it? Uh, I think it's 30 questions, something like that. 30 questions, roughly, with a practice exam, with a bonus question, sorry. Um, what else? Ba -ba 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 -ba. D -d 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 -d. You post the second half of the practice exam. Are you, so I posted, I told you this uh, at the beginning, the, um, the um, uh, videos that where I go over the practice exam, I published the first two parts. The last part, I'll publish it right after class today. I'll edit it right after this class ends. Where's the periodic table? The periodic table was in an announcement that I posted about the instructions. It's also in the instructions for the exam itself. So it's in both places, but it's also in the announcement. Um, uh, what else? Um, yeah, everything is multiple choice except for the bonus question. Yep. Yeah, just remember that the exam is not meant to be some kind of thing to ruin your life. You know, the exam is just to try to see, did you, do you know how to do what we've covered this far? That's all. There's no tricky question or there's, there's questions that you might find uh, tricky, but there's no trick questions, I would say. Um, can we tr get an extra try if we ask? Yeah, yeah, just send me an email and I can give you another attempt at the practice if you want a third one. No problem. But you got to send me an email because I won't remember on here. And plus, I have to edit the video right after class ends today. 